Good morning. You may be seated. Again, it's good to be with you. And I want to, again, this Sunday, extend to all of you my personal blessings for you as a church as you now enter into the summer season, and especially the blessings unto you as you go through the process that most of you are aware of with the Mitten Aid Church during the summertime, with then in September, your congregation making a vote uh, regarding the Mitten Aid Church. So my blessings are with you in that entire process, and you've got several months actually to, to be involved in that process. So I hope that it goes well. I also lift up my blessings upon uh, Charlie Washington and, and his wife Chantelle Washington as he goes through his time of recovery from his stroke uh, and that we may continue to pray for him and to pray for all of you. Diane had mentioned that this is Open and Affirming Sunday, so I want to also make an announcement relating to that. Uh, we are an Open and Affirming Church here at First Church. and I want to share a little bit of history about the Open and Affirming Church. It is a status that is held uh, in the United Church of Christ in particular. There are, I think now, uh, I think 1,400 or so United Church of Christ congregations around the country who are also open and affirming. And many other churches who have not taken that vote but are also in practice open and affirming. So because this church is open and affirming to LGBTQ persons, I hope that you continue to have your doors and activities and programs and worship open to people of all backgrounds. On June 25th, 1972, just five days ago, 52 years ago, there was an historic event within the United Church of Christ. The Golden Gate Association of the Northern California Conference of the United Church of Christ was gathered for an ordination service. William Johnson became the first openly gay person to be ordained into the United Church of Christ on June 25th, 1972, 52 years ago this week. The preparation and the discernment of his local congregation and the association to approve him for ordination was a shining moment in our national church's history. And it was not an easy decision to make. It did not make everyone comfortable, particularly in the 1970s. But his call to ministry was clear. In the end, it de demonstrated that the candidate exceeded all of the qualifications that were required for ordination. And the church was faithful in recognizing this and approving him for ordination. On that same very date, June 25th, 52 years ago, the United Church of Christ Council for Church and Ministry, the national body that is part of the, part of the denomination which does look at search and call and help with the status of uh, ordained clergy and lay people, had recommended to not consider sexual orientation as a determining fact for ordination. So that was happening at the national level when already the same day, the first gay man had been already ordained. The council, which is a national body which determines all of the issues and factors regarding both lay and ordained ministry, should be considered. There were debates and places of disagreement across the denomination, across the country, the overwhelming witness since 1972 has been that the life of the United Church of Christ has been enriched through the welcome of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer folks into the full life and ministry of the church. Our open and affirming journey already was beginning at the time the United Church of Christ was created in 1957. Back in the 1950s, there were several sexuality studies when pastors and congregations were engaging in Bible study concerning the biblical passages often used for excluding LGBTQ persons from the church. And in the 1960s, in the midst of the civil rights movement, some pastors then began speaking out for gay rights 
along with all of the other issues in the 60s, civil rights and human rights. So this church stands as one of those that has been open and affirming for a long time, and not only by theory or words, but by practice. So again, my blessings upon you as you continue that journey. Let us pray the prayer of confession. Almighty God, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed the devices of our own hearts. Have mercy on us. Hear our petitions for your forgiveness. Help us and hear us as we proclaim that we are found in Jesus Christ. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the good news. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we learn that God's love has no bounds. In Christ, we are forgiven and empowered to begin anew. Thanks be to God.
A morning offering will be now given and received.
wanted to take a, a quick minute and thank my wonderful choir, who comes week after week after week and never asks for anything in return. Even in the summer. <laughs> They deal with me every week, so I just have a little a pen and a thank you. Um, and it's been very exciting to me to see the choir grow with our new members. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We all appreciate the choir. Uh, Foster Church in 16 Acres, where I attend worship, our choir stopped singing a week ago. And then during the summer, every Sunday, there's a different group of people, like men, women, children, and then there are a couple of singers that come in to replace the choir. Uh, but it's called a pickup choir, and I'm always amused, literally amused, when I see the entire choir that's on vacation all summer sitting in the front two pews <laughs> faithfully every Sunday they're there. And so it's not so much a pickup choir because the men's choir is made up of the actual choir and the women's choir is made up of the actual women. So it's great. Uh, so, and I'm sure your, your choir is going to be coming too, even though you got a little break here. I'm going to read from the scripture, the gospel reading from Matthew chapter 6. 1 through 15. Uh, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version Bible. And if it sounds familiar to you, I read the same lesson last Sunday because it is the story about Jesus teaching the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do, in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you that they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, you have they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. One time when I was in the Holy Land, uh, a gentleman taught me the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. And I thought, since we really don't have the opportunity to hear Aramaic spoken around in West Springfield, I'm going to read to you uh, the Aramaic text. This is uh, 
basically from the Syriac Aramaic language. It's still a spoken language. There's one church in Springfield that still has its services in the entire liturgy of their services is in Aramaic. So it's still a living language. And if you do speak Aramaic, don't fault me for my pronunciation, okay? Abunad bash mayo, nakidash shmoch, tit malku tok, mewe sabonyak, yakano de bash mayo of baro, hablanach modasun ko nanya mono, washbuk lanach bayen wach to hain, aka nodof kan subakwanel hayo. Bulota Lanel Nasuno Elo Fason Mendisho Meto Dilo Ki Malku Tavah Lo Watshubum To Lolam Ol Min Amin. We know for certain that Jesus spoke in Aramaic. We're not so sure because there's no written evidence of what uh, Jesus spoke. He most likely, because he was in a Roman-occupied area, he might have picked up some Latin. He was also always referring to the Torah, which would be in Hebrew. So he also would have been able to speak Hebrew, if not read Hebrew. And he probably also was hearing Greek. Uh, so it's very possible, even though we don't know for sure, uh, that he probably spoke and understood by hearing, if not writing, uh, three or four languages. We're happy that it's translated for us in English. In the Gospel of Matthew, one of the first times it's recorded that Jesus referred to the kingdom of God. And today I want to talk about that second sentence in the Lord's Prayer. So Matthew records, now when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and dwelt in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, toward the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, as for those who sat in the region in shadows of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he walked along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed Jesus. And he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from all beyond the Jordan. The second petition of the prayer, last Sunday we looked at the first petition or the first sentence. The second petition is, Thy kingdom come. And this, at that time, was a Jewish prayer. And king has always been a favorite name in the Hebrew scripture for God. The synagogue Kaddish reads, may he establish his kingdom during your life and during the life of all the house of Israel. This is also a prayer about the end times or the eschatological times. Jesus is showing the tensions in his teaching 
between the kingdom as impending, coming soon, and yet the kingdom is already operating in the world. The second part is thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is an interpretation then of the kingdom, that God's will will be accomplished. And that God's will is done, the sovereignty of God and his kingdom will then be evident to all people. Now in recent day, in recent years, many churches are using kingdom in place of kingdom because we don't live with kings. Kings do not mean as much the same. So you'll often hear that reference, K-I-N hyphen dum. So instead of kingdom, it's kingdom. And that's scholars have said this would be an appropriate transliteration of kingdom. So it's referring to kingdom. It is the people, the siblings, our brothers and sisters in faith, the kin, kin, we talk about kinfolk, our family. So it's talking about the family, the extended family and the family of the world. Uh, but I'll continue to use the word kingdom because that was the way Jesus referred to it. Gamaliel, who was an ancient rabbi, taught, quote, do his will as thy will, that he may do thy will as his will, and annihilate, uh, annihilate thy will before his will, that he may annihilate the will of others before thy will. Now, what does the kingdom as its coming mean to you? What does the coming of the kingdom mean? Does it mean for you the will of God being done in the here and now, in keeping with God's eternal purpose? It is the rule of God, the loving purpose of God, the mercy and compassion of God in the minds and hearts of people being expressed in all of the relationships and circumstances of life. For God's domain, his kingdom, includes all the world and all the worlds. So it is that we follow those, those expressions of the kingdom of God. When we hear these words, Jesus is saying, God is here, now. Start living as if you believe that he is the ruler of our life now, everywhere. The world that we yearn for is already present. The world that we seek, hope for, is also here. The long night is ended. The daybreak of a new day has already come in the kingdom of God. At the heart of Jesus' proclamation are these facts. Out of the common round of existence of every person, every person, there is already present the kingdom of God. We only need the eyes to see it, the ears to hear it, and the minds to perceive it. With this meaning, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the fulfillment of that that for which we all long. We do not have to wait until tomorrow or some other time or some distant future or the end of our lives to start living. Jesus declares that life is present in our daily lives. God is present in the fullness of his being. Life, love, meaning, our hope. And our prayer is that we may understand and know this truth. May each one of you continue to find meaning in this entire prayer in your daily life and in our times and your times together. Amen. And now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to do far more than what we ask or imagine. Go in the spirit of the living God. Amen. So is this abbreviated to his incarnation of need?